Yeah. Basically, uh, you are now at the, like officially P PU. Yeah. But where are the admins? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, an extremely good coffee machine. That's my hard sell. So come come by and you'll you'll have the best coffee of, of any academic establishment. No, it's a it's a, it's a massive it's a massive it's a massive upgrade. It's this huge gleaming chrome machine. It's beautiful. Come by. <laughs> uh, also for the science, of course. <laughs> Today you will solve the measurement problem? Yeah, it's all done. Okay. So here we go. Thank you. Right, well, thank you for this very nice introduction. I don't know if, how, if this thing, I guess this thing is working. I don't see any indication that it isn't. So I guess if someone's on the stream watching from the group or something, then text Tom, I guess, and say if you can't hear it. Sorry, Tom, to put you on the spot there. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm, yeah, this is me uh, dipping my toe into the murky waters of quantum foundations. So I look forward to the absolute mess that will result, but hopefully it will be fun. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to argue for um, the perspective that uh, measurements are a statistical mechanical phenomenon. Um, uh, I'll spend a while doing that um, before introducing the relevant part of, of quantum statistical mechanics, or at least what I see to be the relevant part. Um, and then I'll describe some of the you know, tentative initial results that we have out um, in the, uh, trying to argue in this direction or trying to examine what this, this perspective might really look like and then briefly discuss some of the future directions that we have. So this is, um, whoop, wrong button. There we go. So yes, we have a paper out in the archive on this, super short, just with some, some first initial stuff out. I recommend you take a look if you're interested. Um, uh, this is in collaboration with um, is it this button? Yeah, with uh, Manu Schwarzhans, Felix Binder, um, and Marcus Hooper. Uh, Manu and Marcus are with me in the Atom Institute. Um, Felix was, we, but this work started when we were all at the Koki, Felix included. Um, right, so open a, open a quantum theory textbook, and you'll, be, and you'll find in it a description of two kinds of evolution of a quantum state. One will be some kind of continuous dynamics, perhaps a unitary generated by some Hamiltonian, uh, and then some kind of CPTP map, which is at least in spirit derived from some kind of master equation um, re resulting from some kind of open system. And then you'll find measurement, a, diff a, a categorically different kind of dynamics, um, which is either some kind of projection or a more general uh, um, um, projection, like positive operator valued measure. Um, so, you know, I'm telling you things, of course, everybody's incredibly familiar with, but just to really hammer that home. The idea, of course, is you start with some initial state, perhaps in some superposition of two seemingly uh, contradictory um, um, states. And then after this measurement process, you will definitely be in one or the other of those. Um, and this happens, of course, <coughs> according to the textbook, instantaneously. So um, you'll have heard this discussed at length. You know, you've probably even seen this photo before, this nice, nice drawing by Zurich. Um, uh, summarizing this kind of Copenhagen perspective on quantum mechanics, where you have this sort of messy, indeterminate world where cats can be both alive and dead at the same time. And then at some point, this measurement occurs, you pass through this kind of quantum to classical barrier, where you show your classical measurement apparatus, and then suddenly everything becomes some well, well-defined classical, um, things have definite values. Um, and there are many problems with this, many measurement problems, you might say. Um, one that you hear very often is, how is a particular measurement outcome chosen? This question, I have to admit, I personally don't find this one so interesting. I'm not entirely sure it's physically well motivated. Another one, which I think is much more interesting, is how do we choose which situation should be modeled by, for example, unitary processes and which by measurements? Um, Chaslav once, I think you have this written in a paper somewhere, but, you're, but I heard it uh, verbally, um, gave me this nice uh, 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 description of this in terms of an optical table. You, put an, uh, you have a beam, and you put an element, maybe I'm misremembering, you can correct me, and you put an element in, you, in your optical table. How do you know if you should be modeling the action of this element by some kind of unitary process or some kind of projector? Did I get that roughly right? Yeah, good. Um, and this question is physically well-defined. It amounts to asking simply what is a measurement? So these are some measurement problems you may have heard of, ones which, for reasons I don't really understand, uh, aren't, more, aren't very much discussed, discussed, are the worst problems with uh, uh, this, uh, this very simple notion of measurement, which is that it breaks all three laws of thermodynamics. For example, you take some initial state row and some measurement basis, 0, 1, and you get the outcome 1. Then, well, the first law, the energy before and the energy afterwards are not equal to each other. Second law, the entropy before is in general greater than or equal to the entropy afterwards. 
this von Neumann entropy here. And third, once you've achieved your measurement outcome, there's some finite energy unitary rotation that will bring you into the ground state, allowing you to achieve ground state cooling with a finite amount of energy in a finite amount of time. And that breaks the third law of thermodynamics. So it's very interesting that we discuss measurement problems so often, but we so rarely look at these measurement problems. Um, this was done very nicely by um, uh, Jelena, Nikolai, and Marcus, all of whom were at Okoki at the time. Um, in this paper, they, they discuss the, these measurement problems and some ways around them, and they find that uh, you, you, if you really try to take account of the resources, the thermodynamic resources involved in, your, in, in performing your measurement, really, your ideal projective measurement has infinite resource cost. Of course, because it is effect, particularly if you look at this third one, you can kind of see from a thermodynamic perspective really the infinite resource nature of this because it's ground state cooling modulo a unitary, you know? Um, and so I thought I'd share with you this very nice quote, which kind of um, uh, is particularly relevant. Sorry for reading out a large wall of text, but that's what I'm going to do anyway. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimenters do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. And yet, Quantum theory hasn't collapsed in deepest humiliation. In fact, it's been incredibly successful. Nobel Prizes, for example, you know? Um, so, okay, well, we're being a little too simplistic here. I've, I've, I've set up the straw man of the textbook, and I'm beating this straw man. But really, nobody believes that that's the whole story, right? Really, we're, I'm, I'm very much an operationalist in the way I like to think about things, and I know that's a, 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 very much in vogue here at Koki. And so, let's try to be an operationalist about it. In fact, von Neumann already did this in 1930, right? We say, okay, uh, what is a measurement? It's really it's an interaction with the thing. You have some other system, and we're forgetting that system. And so we need to think about how that system is interacting with the system of interest. We, we define some probe system, we do some kind of coupling, and then we, then we entangle these things, and now the measurement statistics of the system are now going to re be reproduced in our probe system. Well, that's good. That is interesting. It's a useful thing to do, and it lets you um, think about incompatible measurements as, a, as a, a incompatible observables as a consequence of the inability to to correlate across different bases and these kinds of things. But if we really think about what that means in terms of this picture of a transition from quantum to classical, it's really incomplete. Because what we're effectively saying there is we're going to have so some degree of freedom and some well-controlled well unitary, which needs to be applied for a specific time, a, a well-controlled time, So, in order to correlate with that degree of freedom. Say the, the spin of your electron, oh, let's say this is the stern gerlach apparatus. This is the, the spin of your silver atom is the system. And then this first point of the system is, say, the momentum of this silver atom. Now you're imprinting the statistics of the spin on the, of the spin degree of freedom on the momentum degree of freedom. And then next, it's, this thing is going to hit the, this photographic plate. And so now there's a degree of freedom in this regard that you're now going to, with some extra unitary now, again, running for some very specific time, as it's necessary, to, to make sure these correlate properly to correlate those degrees of freedom. And then what? And then the cable in the, and then the computer that this is plugged into and on and on and on until we have something, I'm, you know, uh, on the order of 10 kilograms, order of magnitude, of course. Um, uh, and, you know, Avogadro's number multiplied by, you can see we need quite a few of these very controlled unitaries. And let's say I made a bet that the spin was up, you know, in order to follow this picture through, there's this, this, this idea that we have now the 10 to the 27th unitary applied for the 10 to the 27th very specific time, which results in me being happy because the spin was up and sad because the spin was down. Clearly, there's, there's something missing here. Do we uh, put a Heisenberg cut in here where we draw the line between quantum and classical? Well, if we do that, we haven't solved anything. We've just pushed the problem further back and then we have the same problem again. Um, how do we account for the fact that there's a, a objectivity, this, this, this spreading out of information such that we can all agree that the thing is zero. It's not just me in this huge superposition, it's you and you and you and it's everybody. Um, and most importantly, this picture requires us to have a really a, effectively infinite degree of control over all of the degrees of freedom to be able to apply these kinds of unitaries. Um, so just to uh, take a sidestep and mention some, some, some other um, sort of directions that have been tried to, to, to look at this kind of problem, what, the first was uh, decoherence theory, or the first of the two that I want to talk about is decoherence theory, which looks at uh, how the environment affects the system and explains uh, under what forms of interaction you can, you, you, 
or sorry, what the form of the interaction is that is necessary to preserve some basis in the system, preserve the information in some basis in the system. So that's a useful piece of the puzzle, but that's really about how the environment affects the system and, and, and preserves its, its measurement outcomes. And then there's quantum Darwinism, which kind of inverts the question and says, how is it that my, um, that my uh, uh, the statistics in this, in this pointer basis are going to be encoded in the environment? And so you get, in quantum Darwinism, you get a picture that often looks like this. This is um, a nicely drawn figure by Manu Schwarzhans. So there'll be some kind of environment and some system and some fraction of the environment that you consider. And you have this phenomenon or, or this property of Darwinism if the uh, mutual information between the system and the fraction of the environment you consider has this kind of classical plateau such that the entropy, uh, this is the entropy associated with, with the probability distribution in the, in the entropy of the system effectively, um, uh, that the mutual information is equal to that very quickly as you increase the size of the fraction you look at. So this is an, an interesting thing, but it's really a statement about the state space. It's not a dynamical model of measurement. It doesn't explain the apparent objectivity of measurement outcomes, how they emerge. Um, and so I've used this word objectivity a few times, but let's actually define it. As was done by these, um, these authors, um, uh, this is Horodecki and uh, I think two Horodeckis and um, or Horodeckis and um, Corbett's also in this paper I believe. But this is very nicely summarised in this review here. Uh, so this definition of object in this definition of objectivity, multiple observers can or objectivity. Let me say, phrase it this way: objectivity is when multiple observers can simultaneously access and independently determine the measurement outcome without disturbing the system, and will come to the same result. If we have these facts, then we have a state. Uh, 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 let me, every, every state which encodes these properties is an objective state with respect to those observers and that system and that observable. Um, yes. So um, what these authors showed is that if you take these, this definition of objectivity um, plus the requirement that, this, that really, like, really hammer home this um, independent part, this is, this is kind of crucial, uh, then you arrive at a particular form of the state space, in the for, a particular form of the state. So this is the point of basis. This is the, the, the basis in which we're, we're thinking about the measurement occurring. This is the probability of occurrence of those measurements. And then this, these are the states of each of these observers, k equals 1 to n. And they have to have this kind of orthogonality property in order for it to really be objective. So I mean, this, this you know, moment inspection, this is kind of clear, right? If the, syst if the system is in state i, then observer k sees rho k i and rho ki and rho kj are perfectly distinguishable from each other. Um, we're shown also in the, in nicely in this paper that um, this spectrum broadcast structure actually implies quantum Darwinism, but uh, you need to, it implies actually, a, the, the, it's a one-way implication. If you, if you make a stronger form of quantum Darwinism called strong quantum Darwinism, then in fact it's a two-way implication. Um, but again, as with Darwinism, this is, a, this is a statement about the state space. Yeah, please. So you, you already know this implication. It's really like these three uh, assumptions that you have before yeah. Uh, yeah. imply that the state has to be of that form. Yes. So, I mean, the way it's phrased in these papers is that they remove the word independently and then they add an extra, a fourth one called the strong independence condition. I've just bunched it together to make it a little simpler. But this is laid out in this, in this paper for the first time and then, and then there's a kind of pedagogical discussion of it in there if you're curious. But these, these three facts and perhaps you know, there may be some wiggle room in how you decide to encode them mathematically. But if you agree with their mathematical encoding of these facts, then a consequence of that is simply that the state has to have this structure. Um, so we can effectively just call this an objective state, a state that corresponds to objectivity in this basis. Notice, of course, that if we consider some other basis that's, uh, that ha let's say, there's an example, one that's mutually unbiased with respect to this I basis, then now the states, the, the conditional states that you're going to get in the observers are not going to be orthogonal to each other. So the observers don't have any information about that basis, for example. But again, just as with Darwinism, this is a statement about a state space. It's not a dynamical model. It doesn't show us how we, how we go from, in, in principle, a quantum superposition to a set of objective facts in a way that is spontaneous, irreversible, and doesn't require exact control of constituents. So what might allow us to do that? Well, you've heard the title of the talk. 
you can see where I'm going with this, right? We do have a notion of dynamics in physics, which is spontaneous, irreversible, and doesn't require the exact control of constituents. It's equilibration, which, of which thermalization is, of course, the best known aspect, but that's just a particular case of equilibration. Yeah, please. Uh, I will come to that. Uh, in fact, I, I mean a notion of irreversibility, uh, irreversibility uh, that I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to come to the, the, the statistical mechanics part, and I, I'm, I'm really surprised we don't hear about this much, this much more often, because I think it's really a kind of a revolution in, in, in quantum theory that, that, that went like totally silently somehow, certainly unknown outside of the StatNet community. But yeah, we'll come to that. Um, so from this, we, this, this, to me, lends natu itself naturally to the, to the hypothesis that actually measurements aren't some kind of uh, ontologically different uh, 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 process. Uh, you, there's no objective collapse in the sense of, uh, of um, something special is happening there beyond simply uh, statistical mechanics. The trick is just finding how statistical mechanics can get you there. And in order to do that, in order to formulate that, formalize that, we state what we call the measurement equilibration hypothesis. Just very, very simple. Measurement is an entropy increasing transition towards an equilibrium state. And this is not a new idea. I mean, the idea of measurements increase entropy is actually very old. You can find many papers on it, all the way back to Schillard and von Neumann. In fact, if, you're, if you looked at quantum thermodynamics and heard of the Schillard engine, um, this is the paper in which that is introduced. And what I didn't know, when it, what, what we don't talk about when we, often when we introduce the Schillard engine, is that it wasn't really about this Maxwell's demon idea, it was really about trying to say, hey, this is an argument why we should think of measurement as something which increases your entropy, rather, even though by appearance it decreases it. So by formulating like this, I don't it, it might seem like a grandiose thing to do, but, but the idea is to, is to really um, state this as a physical principle so that we can inter interrogate it, so that we can try to disprove this hypothesis, for example. Um, so let me be, state it a little bit more clearly for the present context. So what, what, what do I mean by this hypothesis? I mean, including the observers in the phase space, measurement is an entropy increasing transition from a system in superposition, in general, to a region of that very large state space, commensurate with the observers finding a well-defined outcome for the system in an objective manner. Okay, a bit of a mouthful, but we'll unpack it. But in order to really do this, we need this notion of, um, of, of equilibration that I, that I alluded to. So we need to answer two questions. One, how can a closed system equilibrate? We know that the von Neumann entropy, uh, well, okay, how can a, one, how can a closed system equilibrate? We know that unitary rotation is called a rotation because it's simply, because it's, a, a, in, a, for, a, for example, for finite dimensions, periodic. It's, there is no, there's no um, many to one behavior to this, which is uh, the hallmark of equilibration. And secondly, how can this unitary evolution increase entropy? And the answer is this idea of equilibration on average, which is reviewed in this really nice review, um, Goglin and Isaac. Strongly recommend this. It's a, a very, very long, but it's worth coming back to again and again, doing in, like dealing with in bite-sized chunks because really there's so much there, so much interesting stuff, so much to learn. Okay, so so what do we mean by equilibration on average? So in this in this um, um, corner of statistical mechanics, let's say, you have some equilibrium state which you calculate via, via the infinite time average of the state. That is to say, you have some initial state and some, ha Hamil some Hamiltonian evolving that whole state, which gives you this, and then you average this over all times. You take the unitary orbit of that state through the state space and take the state that averages you along that orbit. It's very simple. And this is, this is your equilibrium state. But in what sense is it your equilibrium state? Well, in the following, for example, for some observable, call it O, the expectation value that you will find for the actual state that you have of that observable, take the difference with the expectation value that you would find in the equilibrium state, and you will find that the time average of that difference is bounded above by the size of the observable divided by the effective dimension. What's the, what is the effective dimension? It's, it's effectively the dimensionality of the state space that's going to be explored by the evolution. So if you start in an in a energy eigenstate, you have an effective dimension of one because you're going to stay in that eigenstate, you're just going to accrue a phase. If you start in an equal superposition of n eigenstates, then you're going to have an effective dimension of n. Um, yes. So this was um, proved in this paper here um, and developed further in others. So here we, we really see that 
it's the it's the, the observable that's equilibrating here, not the not the um, not the state. And this is I've, for the simplicity of just showing it here without having to define lots of lots of the terms in an equation. I've given you this version, which is the the time average of this entire thing. If you take the, the sorry the infinite time average of this of this difference between these uh, expectation <coughs> values, there is a much more useful. This is not this is the intuitive but not useful version. The useful version uh, takes this over some small time window, um, and then you find this factor, and then another factor that depends on the time and some other features of the spectrum. Yes? Oh, th this is this is an upper bound, right? It's so, 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 so the left. This, this side gets smaller as the effective, effective function increases, right? So, so the, the, the more of the state space you're exploring, for if you have... Yeah, and it, it, it's in a sense if I have a superposition of infinite humanity, mm -hmm. then the right-hand side goes to zero, mm -hmm. whereas the left-hand side, if I pick up a particular time, I, can, I have a feeling I can pick up the time in which the state is orthogonal to the one... Yes, yes, but by virtue of the fact that, you're, that you are exploring through so many states, the time for which you are orthogonal is so narrow that it gets washed out. And that's exactly why the, in fact, um, I'm gonna skip this equilibration of subsystems part and jump straight to, jump straight to this. Um, this is really the really important key part of this, right? The state does not evolve to the equilibrium state, but becomes on average close to it with respect to some observable or some subsystem. So you will be at many points in time orthogonal to the equilibrium state. The, the point is you will, you will just be there for such a short time that even a small amount of time averaging removes this possibility. Another way to say it is if I pick, if I, if I have a, a bag full of states, each one with a different time label, and I draw from this bag, the chances of me finding a state which is far away from this is negligible. So they are there. They're technically there in the state space. But you just don't see them. One way to see this is, you know, this, sorry, this is... Um, uh, this omega here should be the, the, the equilibrium state, the infinite time average state. So the idea is that you have, for some observable which equilibrates, a, let's call it A, the expectation value of this thing corresponding that in the state row of T, at the time T, um, the difference of that with the, the expectation value of that in the equilibrium state <coughs> will fluctuate around. But the point is that it stays close to zero for most of the times. And then there will be times where it fluctuates very largely, but this will be a very narrow fluctuation. And indeed, you will have a Poincaré recurrence. You will come back to this point, and you will, you know, there will be some point way, way, way down this line, some way out in whatever the hell is in, is several miles in that direction, that looks like exactly that takes exactly this form. This, this curve will repeat itself. So it's that notion of equilibration. Does that maybe clear up what you're? Yeah, but sorry, this, this average here is, this is a time ah, average. Ah, now I've seen this average. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. This and average is over time. Over all time. Oh, and, then, and then this is makes this actually not that useful. It's just intuitive, but not that useful. Because, of course, if you average this dif difference over all of time, it's going to be close to the, uh, the infinite time average state. So that's not so crazy. What is crazy is that actually when you relax that um, and have some, you know, put some subscript T here to represent that this average OB only happens over some relatively small time, then you have actually the same thing, just with some factor here. And then you can talk about equilibration times. How long does it take for my system to equilibrate from this given initial state? Where equilibration really means equilibration on average. So if you want to say that my system is equilibrated, what you really have to do is say, make statements that are very, which have a lot of caveats in them, like for an amount of time, this, my state will be no, long, no greater than epsilon away with probability delta. Um, so that's really the notion of equilibration that, that, that um, I'm talking about. And, and th I think this is really incredibly, incredibly interesting because we're so used to 
thinking about equilibration in quantum systems as this um, definite evolution of some state at a certain time to an equilibrium, equilibrium state. But that's not really what, what we even do classically. When you think about my, my favorite example, I, I, I use it like once a day, you think about a room and, you, and all of the molecules of, that, of air in that room in start in one corner with some relatively well-defined definition of velocities pointing roughly towards the center. You wait some time and then now make a histogram of the, those velocities and you'll find that they satisfy the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, right? No, they won't satisfy the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. They'll be tiny, 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 if you make this histogram and then draw the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve over that, there'll be tiny differences from that. We're familiar with that, we call that thermal fluctuation. But th what we don't think about so often, but I mean, it's of course obvious, there will be very, very specific moments that we can choose where that histogram will be very far away from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And indeed, with Poincaré recurrence, if we wait however many multiples of the, t of the lifetime of the universe, all of those particles will eventually go back to the corner of the room. So the, this idea of equilibration that I'm talking about here is, is exactly the, really the same one that we use in, in, in classical statistical mechanics. Um, and I think it's just an accident of history that when we talk about equilibration in quantum systems, we went to a totally different idea of what equilibration should mean in, in open systems. Um, yeah, I think I've, please. Yeah, yeah, so there's a quantum uh, recurrence theorem. Yeah. Uh, I got this one from Joe Monkey, but he said if we average over all time, it's actually not such an efficient move because obviously it's going to be close to the equilibrium state. But then over which time do you average the difference of the equilibrium time? That's also an infinite time. So, so what I meant to say was uh, the infinite time. The fact that this is an infinite time average is not such an interesting statement. It's useful sort of pedagogically or to illustrate as a first step. The thing that really is useful is when you then generalize that to a finite time average. That's what I meant, of this quantity. Does this statement also hold, like this inequality also holds if we only average over a finite time average? Yes, there's just a correction term now that depends on the amount of time. It's like an f of t. We could, I could, maybe I could have just put f of t here and put the t here and then been done with it. Maybe that was the better way to do it. Please. Yeah, just to clarify, this is about the equation of the room in systems, right? I didn't hear. Yes, yes. This, this version, uh, well, actually, both of them, yes. This is this, so equilibration on average is sometimes called closed system equilibration for that, for that, um, for that same reason. And this is, again, I, much, much, much closer to our classical idea of equil equilibration. When I, I mean, I didn't actually do a physics undergraduate, I did a chemistry undergraduate. So when I learned the second law of thermodynamics, it was the, the entropy of, of a system increases, uh, the entropy of a closed system increases in the course of spontaneous change, right? So. Uh, this, th it's really this, this notion of increasing entropy that is, I think is the, is the, the one that, that most closely touches with what we classically talk about in, in statistical mechanics. Um, and so just to drive home this point about entropy maximization, this infinite time average, this equilibrium state, it is the maximum entropy state given all of the constants of motion. So as you, as you tend to statistics which are commensurate <laughs> with the same, or as you tend to observable statistics, which mimic the statistics of this state, you are tending, in effect, to a higher entropy state, um, even though you have uh, unitary evolution. So that's why, I, I, that when, I, when we want to talk about using this to model measurement, we'll be talking about the modeling of measurement via the process of entropy maximization. This is um, discussed at length in, a, in uh, one of the sections in this, in this review. Sorry, does it depend on the initial state that it's passed through, like? Uh, in general, yes but there, there's a degree of initial state independence. And the degree of initial state independence varies depending on the number of constants of motion. So the maximum entropy state is a very big state, given the constant of motion. Right, depending on how many there are. very different Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, so if you, if you generally speaking, uh, I don't know if there's a way to phrase this as it isn't so mathematical, but if you write your initial state um, as a sum of degenerate subspaces, any superpositions of those subspaces get, get wiped out. So any states which differ only in those superpositions of those subspaces will, end, will reach the same equilibrium state. And um, if you're familiar with the idea of um, uh, with, um, the relationship between integrability, chaos, and thermalization, then um, jumping for a moment, say, to classical physics, you have integrable systems which, which, which don't um, uh, thermalize. Uh, these are the ones that have as many constants of motion as they do degrees of freedom. Uh, well, apply that to the same idea, and then you'll see that actually the state, there is no 
um, uh, uh, there, are no, there are no two states that will equilibrate to the same state in that perspective. Those, in fact, you would say those don't equilibrate. Um, whereas the, 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 more, the greater the imbalance between your constants of motion and your degrees of freedom, the more entropic your maximum entropy state is. And indeed, when the only constant of motion is the energy, which is unavoidable as a constant of motion if you have a time-independent Hamiltonian, then this is the thermal state. And so that's, that's the particular example of, uh, equilib of equilibration where we talk about equilibration to the thermal state, i.e. thermalization. Frustratingly, the words equilibration and thermalization are mixed up in the literature a lot because thermalization is the version of equilibration that people tend to care about most because a lot of thermodynamics is concerned with the question why are thermal states so ubiquitous in nature. In nature. Um, yeah. uh, so, I mean, I already kind of, I think I already touched on many of these points, but um, it's clear the system is closed, the evolution is unitary, and yet we have equilibration. Some caveats are equilibration time. I discussed this, so, so you know we need to make, take this finite time average in order to really talk about how long it takes for a system to equilibrate. Um, the generacies play uh, uh, um, have a lot of various subtle roles. Um, with the result that, that I showed you were uh, for non-degenerate Hamiltonians. Um, and then there's uh, the question of recurrences. I discussed this briefly, and the fact that we need a large effective dimension. So, that, so then if we want to show that um, large systems tend to equilibrate and in general, in fact, tend to thermalize this particular form of equilibration, then we need to argue that the effective dimension is typically large. So then we have to define what large is and what we mean by typically. All of these things are discussed in detail in this, um, in this review. Uh, yes. Okay, so finally, to the point. How am I doing for time? Pretty well. Okay, good. So to make... To, to, to try to investigate this, this thing that we've dubbed this measurement equilibration hypothesis, um, we can ask a very simple question. Uh, and it's a very restricted question, a very toy model. Measurement is so much more than this, but just to start, to find some piece of firm ground to stand on, let's ask the question, when does the equilibrium state have this spectrum broadcast structure? That is to say, under what circumstances can the measurement equilibration hypothesis result in, can measurement, according to the measurement equilibration hypothesis, result in objectivity? with no extra structure and no extra assumptions? The, the answer is never. In fact, as we've, as we've proved, it's, um, there's a more general class of, st of states than the SBS state, which, can, which cannot be the result of an equilibration process, and that's the so-called classical quantum states if you demand that your classical states are distinguishable from each other. So any time, I can go back to, sorry, I probably should have put this in. There we go. So if actually we forget about the substructure of these things and just bunch all of these things into one environment and just demand that those environments are distinguishable from each other for um, distinct states, then even that is impossible, let alone the, the requirement that, each, that everybody agrees somehow about measurement outcomes. Um, well, there's definitely no unitary that does that for, for arbitrary initial states because um, it's, a, it's a rank deficient state. So start with a pure state, and you're clearly not gonna get there. You can't unitarily evolve from a, uh, a rank one state to a, to a rank greater than one state, right? because unitary evolution preserves rank. But the, this, this, the map that, that takes you from your initial state to your equilibrium state, again, really stressing the fact that you don't evolve from the equilibrium state to the, fr sorry, from the initial state to the equilibrium state, just some observables will look like that. Um, but when you ask the question, what is the equilibrium state given some initial state, that is in fact rank uh, increasing in general. It's a pinching map. It deletes coherences in, in, the, in, the, in the Hamiltonian argument. So There's no way that you can achieve this objective state structure purely through an equilibration process. No matter what, there is no unitary, there is no Hamiltonian who... And no, there is no Hamiltonian and no initial state such that the equilibrium state is objective. <laughs> uh, appendix one. <laughs> um, I mean, a simple way to do it is to say, okay, well, let me write my, uh, some arbitrary initial state and let me write my Hamiltonian. And then I know if I set this equal to this, it has to have this form. And this, what this implies necessarily is that the Hamiltonian is going to commute with that form. And so that imposes a certain form on your Hamiltonian. And then you simply work it through. You say, I start with some, some 
uncorrelated initial state, this is an assumption that you, because of course, sorry, you could start in this state and then have pick some Hamiltonian which is, for, of which that is an eigenstate. Okay, great, job done, but not job done really, you've just cheated. So we make the assumption you start with, you don't start with the environment correlated with the system. That's a crucial assumption, perhaps I should have laid it out here. Um, the fact that your Hamiltonian is gonna have to commute with this for this to be an equilibrium state tells you that strongly restricts the form of the Hamiltonian that you can consider, then take an arbitrarily un arbitrary uncorrelated state, evolve it with a Hamiltonian of that form, and show that you simply can never have the orthogonality requirement um, on a whole environment, let alone on a, on a, on a observer by observer basis. But, I mean, that may then sound like, like did this work then? Like, we've, we've disproven the, the measurement equilibration hypothesis. The job done, right? No, I mean, like, we've, we've been incredibly, incredibly strict here. We've demanded that this is equal, that not approximate, and that alone is enough to save us to some degree, as we'll show in a second. But um, just to, to drive home the point, this is what we're saying there is exact and projective measurements are impossible under the measurement equilibration hypothesis with no additional, I'm, I keep saying with no additional something because at the end I'm gonna talk about how we've been too strict on what we've allowed ourselves. Um, but it's not surprising that it's impossible. This paper that I showed, this ideal, ideal projective measurements have infinite resource costs. This equilibration is an incredibly strict accounting for resources. We allow ourselves nothing other than some out of equilibrium initial states and the process of equilibration. Um, so it's not surprising that it's impossible, but what's surprising is that actually, even if we start in a pure state, that doesn't help. In this, in this paper, they said, well, if we're really gonna account for the resources, we can't have a perfectly pure state because that's equivalent to ground state cooling. Um, and that under that assumption, they proved that it's impossible. If they allow themselves a pure initial state, then it is in fact possible with finite resources. In this, from this perspective, from our perspective, or with the, with the, let's say with the restrictions we've made for ourselves, that is not the case. Pure states don't help you. Um, another interesting thing to do is, look at, is to look at this von Neumann measurement scheme that I talked about before. These unitaries that, that cause these couplings in the spaces have to have a very particular form, and that is the form of some, some observable whose, uh, whose eigenbasis is this pointer basis, the, the, the measurement basis, and then some other observable on, on the thing that you're coupling to. This is what we're now labeling E as the environment. But actually, the equilibrium state under this evolution has no correlations between the environment and the system. You simply have, you, yes, you preserve the statistics in the, in, the, in the measurement basis, which you need to do, but you don't spread this information through the environment. But as I've, keep, as I've already said a few times, we're asking way too much. We've demanded exact equilibration to the sp spectrum Borka structure, and we haven't even allowed a little bit of control. Of course, measurements aren't pure, always purely uncontrolled processes. So let's relax the first point and, and say, okay, what about approximate objectivity? And indeed, we can achieve it if we, if we consider a conditional form Hamiltonian like this. So let's break down what this is doing. What it's saying is, if the system is in the state I, then I'm going to act with the Hamiltonian HKI with some coupling, say, CK. That's it. Uh, and then coarse grain the observers in the following way. So we had all these observer systems up to N, and we'll just bunch them together into macro observers, let's say. What's the reason for doing this? Well, the reason is, the, 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 if you have a photo detector that's supposed to detect that the, there was a photon there, you don't need every single electron spin inside that thing to encode that degree of freedom. That's way too much, that's way too strong a demand. What you need is just the macroscopic observables of that thing encode the measurement outcome. Um, and under that condition you find that indeed you reach something that looks like the spectrum broadcast structure state. This, so we have this, you know, the probabilities of the outcomes projected onto the pointer basis and then distinct conditional states of each now macro observer corresponding to each measurement outcome. And there was the demand that these things are orthogonal for different values of i for different measurement outcomes, which we showed was impossible. But as we show in the paper, under these circumstances, the fidelity between these things decreases exponentially with the number of macro systems that you, that you gathered together into one. Uh, and this is just some positive constant that depends on the initial state and the Hamiltonian of these things. But it's always positive. And so, to summarize, I think, no, I think okay. Um, yes, so to summarize, this, this um, measurement equilibration hypothesis is a way of, re of resolving the thermodynamic problems that are associated with, with measurement. Uh, and it also helps us to address, with this, with this particular example at least, helps us to, to address a conceptual issue of when to model a process as a projection. So in this model, it's when there's a conditional interaction 
and, the, and it's happening with a big system and you care about the, mac the macroscopic observables. And we've said that, well, okay, ideal projective measurements are impossible, but they can be approximated exponentially well as you gather together more systems. Um, and the outlook, well, this was incredibly simple and restrictive, as I, as I keep stressing. You know, this is a very basic, basic thing we've done. Um, we could allow some unitary control, some pre-measurement. Coming back to the Stern-Gerlach experiment, you have your, um, your silver atom with two states of spin, uh, and it, goes, it passes through some inhomogeneous magnetic field, which has been set up precisely to correlate the momentum degrees of freedom with the internal spin degrees of freedom. So that is actually is unitary control. And it's only after that, when those spins hit the photographic plates, that the sort of spontaneous part needs to occur. So if we actually take account for this unitary control, as we are currently in the process of doing, you'll find that actually it relaxes some of the, some of the stringencies of what we've done so far. And then, there, of course, there are basic questions about, this was, a, this was a, a, for a projective measurement, what about more general POVMs? What about for continuous variables? These are, this is, what is the, the effective dimension of a continuous, continuous uh, uh, variable system? What about the, ener the energetics quantifying? I mean, I've said, as I said, this is, this, is, this is entropy maximization as a process, but we haven't quantified the entropy. So that's one thing to be done. Uh, and then another thing is, that I think is very, very interesting is to ask the question, what, what, what do the so these many well-known measurement paradoxes look like if we're going to adopt this measurement, this, um, this um, measurement equilibration hypothesis perspective? Uh, and that's, again, also something we're actively pursuing that I'm very happy to chat about if anybody wants to chat. Uh, so yes, if you're interested, here's the paper once again. And uh, yeah, any questions? <coughs> with no fluctuations whatsoever. No fluctuations at all. Yeah, so what we're looking at is, is the density matrix, and you just see that off-diagonal terms of the density matrix all evolve to zero and stay there. Under, under reversible dynamics, you have... <coughs> it's completely unitary evolution, yeah. And yet you have an irreversible process. Yep, yep, it's, it's weird. But it's actually... Okay. The reason why we did it was to try to justify the quantum Boltzmann equation, which is used all the time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the quantum Boltzmann equation is typically viewed as an approximation where you're sort of just getting rid of off-diagonal terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but what we showed is actually the off-diagonal terms, if you calculate their evolution, actually go to zero. And there is absolutely no averaging whatsoever in, your, in what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, just only the fact that we're doing the density matrix over the, you know, uh, over the uh, whole system. I mean, I, um, I'd be very interested to read the paper. I, uh, I hope you don't mind if I maintain a, a, a certain dose of skepticism that there isn't some irreversibility, irreversibility stuck into there. But please don't take that as an insult because you're in yeah. extremely good company. Boltzmann did the same thing with his H theorem yes, and only later discovered that he got so. It's partly because it's an infinite system. Uh, yeah. And basically, uh, what you'd say is if it was finite, then all these off diagonal terms would not go to exactly zero, they would just go to oh so close to zero, and so all the information would be in principle recoverable. But they don't, they don't actually go to zero though, right? That's, this, this is the, um, the, the key point. They fast towards zero. Yeah. The, if you average over a certain amount of time, then what you, what you will see over that average will go exponentially faster to zero. But at, at any given specific moment in time, all of the off-diagonal terms are there, because all of the coherences remain, because it is completely unitary finite dimensional well, system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I, mean, it's, it's sorry, I was referring to what I was, I don't know about your case, but yeah, I'd be very, very interested to see that. Thank you. I guess some of the problems are also related to how it can be seen. I imagine that I think a limit such that I always wait for in approximate, in, in approximate units longer than what's the dimension of the system. 
Then I let the, the measure of the system go to infinity. Then I guess that you know, stuff go back. It's just that uh, if you say, mm. oh, I, I call it dimensional. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's also a question. I'm sorry to get into that. But it's always this problem of how you, in which order you take the stuff in. So. Yeah. But I mean, I, I will, I will, I'll look at the paper. I'm very, very curious about this. I mean, we, we want to talk about um, uh, about um, infinite dimensional systems, continuous variable systems. So, so it will be, I think, useful inspiration for that at least. That's a that's a, a brilliant question. I mean, so I mean I can think aloud, <laughs> if you like, but uh, 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 take that for what it's worth. So, if you know, there are a couple of different ways that I've heard people talk about Wigner's friend. It's very much something I, I I wouldn't say that I understand well. So I'm 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 extremely hesitant to talk about it in front of a room full of people who know about it very well. But I'm going to do so anyway because I'm that arrogant. Um, so. A key part of the, a key stage in this, in this idea of Figner's friends is a moment, Figner's friend is a moment where there is one observer for whom there is a definite outcome and another observer for whom there is not, right? Um, so what does that mean? If, if definite outcome in this model is supposed to be a consequence of some kind of equilibration, what you said is that there's equilibration for some observable and not equilibration for another observable. But that's actually a, a well-known phenomenon within equilibration. Some people call this pre-thermalization. It's a term I don't like so much, but it's, but it's, that's sort of the term that's stuck. And this is the idea that you have, this is not so um, difficult to really imagine. If you have, um, if you have uh, multiple systems and you have one coupling term, let's say A, B, and C are your systems, one coupling term A, B, and one coupling term B, C. And if this one is much, much smaller than this one, or is somehow timed such that it doesn't turn on until later, you evolve under your free Hamiltonians plus this evolution and equilibrate under those conditions. Equilibrium state is determined by the Hamiltonian. And then it's sometime later, this one is turned on, or it's so small that it's only relevant at much later times. Then there's some later time where now this Hamiltonian is relevant for your dynamics. And now you have a new equilibrium state. So you'll have some kind of, you, when people talk about uh, pre-thermalization, they often draw something like this. You'll have some kind of observable, and then there's its initial state, and it will do its thing, and then equilibrate to this on average. I'm exaggerating the fluctuations, of course. And then after some time, it will jump, and then do this on average. This is the equilibrium state that corresponds to the whole Hamiltonian, and this is the equilibrium state that corresponds to just this Hamiltonian. So perhaps this is a way of modeling it. I, I mean, one needs to be more careful about these things. Also, temporal control, I'm, I'm, I'm very much not a fan of, and I think that's kind of a key part of modeling this process. If you want to describe the universe as a closed system somehow and put your observers inside it, then you have to really ask, how am I getting this? How much, like, where is this? If I'm going to write h of t, where does that function t come from? Really, it's an observer, it's another observer doing something classical, turning some driving field, some magnetic field, say, to change the Hamiltonian of my spins. So it's probably, one could probably model it in that way. And if one were not, if I wanted to be disingenuous, I could probably completely ignore this fact and write a whole paper about it. But I think actually it's kind of a key physical thing that, that if, you, if you just do that, then you're kind of sneaking something in. And that I don't know how to resolve. Uh, and you don't think like in, in Wigner's friend, like uh, Wigner in the end usually has a definite outcome with probability one. Mm -hmm. No, I mean this, uh, and this kind of comes to the question of interpretations, right? If, you, if, if, if we're going to take as a basis this idea of states of the system and the observers with this kind of objectivity property, in that you still have a mixture of the different outcomes. So anything that is, an, uh, is a possible outcome, say, say, it's, say the Wigner's measurement is, say the, the measurement is zero and one, and then there's you know, the friend saying zero and one, and then there's the Wigner saying zero and one. Every, every, like both of these combinations are in the, are in the, the objective state structure somehow. So, but what, I mean, what you're saying is, if I understand correctly, you're saying that the Wigner can see the answer zero whilst at the same time having seen the person get one, is that, the, other, the friend get one, is that right? I don't think that's...
-hmm. And then now like this combined system of si um, the system and the friend, mm -hmm. like from weakness perspective, is in a pure state, mm -hmm. like in an entangled state. Basically. Yeah. So he can do a measurement to the fail basis, for instance. Mm -hmm. and then like he sees one outcome with the probability one. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. So, so I think this can still be c encapsulated in this in this approach because this one, if this is supposed to model the friend's measurement, then this has to have certain. I mean, um, put up this conditional form as a very, very um, like over strict version of this. But you, this needs to it, somehow, the pointer basis, the basis that you're going to measure in, is going to feature clearly in this, right? You know, the, uh, if you're performing a basis in a measurement in one basis, you're really not performing a, measure, a measurement in another basis. It's a key part of quantum mechanics. Um, and so, what basis the friend measures in in the system, and what basis Wigner measures in, in order to determine the friend's outcome, if those correspond to measurements on two different systems in two different bases, then that can equally well be um, incorporated in this. So first, thanks for the talk. It was very clear. Uh, I wonder, uh, since you are saying that, that this could have implications, and we are discussing right now in terms of weakness friends and other things that have to do more with foundations or eventually, I don't know, if interpretations of quantum mechanics. Uh, I think uh, uh, the way I see this construction is like a much more robust um, uh, way on, on how to figure out how, to, how out of an unitary evolution one could mimic for all practical purposes and arbitrary, precise as desired, what would be an instantaneous mm -hmm. collapse problem. No? That's, that's yeah. how I understand it from the formal perspective. Yeah. But I, I wonder, moving from the formalism to the physical scenario, how much this could bother with intuition. And I clarify, for example, here what we are going to get is, some, is a density metric. Mm -hmm. We see in the glass is more density metrics, is that one concrete outcome and not the others. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this can be uh, a, a product made of that, but this question remains as much open. And, and, and another thing I wonder is that uh, the relation, the, the fact that we move from, from, a, from, from a given state to, uh, to the, this equilibrium state that satisfies the correct properties to time averages, mm, does that mean that our empirical evidence and empirical perception, we are, I mean, because it, it, this seems to me, if I try to think of it in terms of, of, <coughs> of interpretations of quantum mechanics, a very precise, realistic uh, model, no? Yeah. <laughs> this, that, that's uh, my intuition from uh, where, where you do apparatus and then if there, there's a wave function going out there and then do, if you do apparatus on it, then you find that there are certain properties where you find so I'm, I'm asking in this direction. I mean, how this connects to the usual idea, and, and why do we happen to get see well one definite outcome and not yeah. the others? Okay, so the first question. Sorry, there was a lot in one. So the first question was about um, connecting a little bit more to sort of physicality. To, to and uh, if I can maybe rephrase it, what predictions does this have as a model? That, uh, other than just being perhaps another interpretation or something like this. Uh, and then I would say that, um, at, of course. A, a, an extremely important question, um, uh, and one that I hope we can resolve. I have some, my, and, my, and my hopes are in the direction of um, the times that it takes. We know that collapse is, uh, appears to be instantaneous, it appears to be extremely quick, um, but it can't be infinitely fast um, unless something categorically different is going on, and then in which case the measurement equilibration hypothesis is not, not true. So if, for example, we can find bounds on, on, on measurement times, which somehow can be related to to um, actual measurement times, then this is one way of doing it. Um, uh, another is the potential is it, perhaps via sort of simulations, looking at the reversibility of processes, um, because this, these things are in principle reversible. Um, but uh, then that leads very neatly, I think, to your to your second question, which is about we seem like in our experience we irreversibly do land in a given outcome, right? Um, as I said at the beginning. Uh, I hope I won't offend you by saying I think that's the, le the less interesting question of the measurement problem, because not because, or from a physical perspective, not because I don't think it's philosophically interesting, but because I think I, I don't know how to turn it into a physically well-posed statement that could then be answered with physics, which makes it more of a sort of philosophy thing than a physics thing, although I'm very happy to be proven wrong there. It would be super cool 
that were not the case, I'm sure, before Bell's theorem, people were talking, the, saying the same thing about the indefiniteness of, indefiniteness of uh, observables before they were measured. So I'm, I'm very happy if someone can then do a Bell's theorem on that and, and show that there is actually some you know, physical, that, that is a physical statement, not a philosophical one. Um, but of course, if we take this, this hypothesis, this measurement equilibration hypothesis, for a moment as a given, and then ask, what, what does it look like to, as an observer, as a human observer, to see the spin up, if that's the mechanism? Well, if you're asking if you can re reverse that somehow, you might as well ask if you can reverse the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, the physics is all microscopically irreversible. In principle, even classically, large-scale systems, the egg can jump out, or jump, you know, the, all of the, however many popular science examples you will have, one will have heard, you know, the egg can jump back off of the floor and put itself back in its shell spontaneously, but the, we're not going to make that happen, right? Um, so I would say it's a consequence of the theory that you can't really, once you as an observer have seen a definite measurement outcome, it's a consequence of the theory that you, you're never going to get something different from that just simply being objective reality for you now. So I go back and forth. So there are two parts that are bound this one, right? One is the, the, um, the operator norm of the operator, and one is the effective dimension. I go back and forth on, on how to understand the operator norm myself, because we can kind of quite easily, um, you know, the, this, this thing, this, this quantity, a trace of this, this has units, right? So when we talk about stuff being large or small, if there are units, then, then we're not really talking about stuff being large or small. Big, big things are bigger than one, and small things are smaller than one, right? We need to somehow normalize this. So if we consider some sort of equivalent observable, which takes, a, takes away the, which takes somehow, rescales the largest outcome to plus one, say, and the smallest outcome to minus one. Um, well, when you do that, the operator norm is one. So then, for such an observable, the, the bound is just one over the effective. So that's one way of maybe understanding what, this, the, what role this is playing. It's, the, it's there to give the right-hand side dimensions in the same way that the left-hand side had dimensions. Um, and, and, and to set the scale of this observable. Some observables have answers in, say, kilograms, and some in nanograms, you know. Um, although that wouldn't be represented by an observable, but that's a whole nother, whole nother question. Um, so then the question of the effective dimension. Well, the, this, this comes back to the, the sort of physical mechanism behind equilibration on average. So the idea is, it, if you write uh, if you write this row of t here in the energy eigenbasis, you'll have uh, an ask about the, what's the time dependence of each of the component of that say matrix. All of the diagonal terms, of course, don't have any evolution, right? So all of the time evolution is just in the phases, the rotating phases of all the off-diagonal elements, and the more, the greater the effective dimension, the more terms there'll be in the, arg in, the, in the angles of those exponentials. And so the more, the faster they decohere, the faster they're rotating around. And, and what that means is that when you take a, the, the larger the effective dimension, the smaller the time average necessary for those rotations to wash themselves out and disappear. And, that, and the, the state, that resulting state where you delete all of those coherences, is precisely the equilibrium state. Maybe that answers your question. Okay, no further questions? Okay, if not, then thanks, Max, much more. Yeah, thank you.
I, I'm pretty sure I cited it uh, towards the end. Give me your email address. Let me just turn this microphone off.